Uh, what's good, YouTube? It's me, your boy Squiddy, back in another Squiddyo. As you can see, we are finally in good quality 1080p, 4K, whatever the heck is going on. But yes, we just got this new camera, and this is amazing. I want to give a huge shout out to my good friend Cynthia for actually making this possible. Uh, with her help, we were able to get this awesome new camera. So huge, huge shout out to her. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And this is great because now you guys don't have to see my kitchen in previously potato quality. You can now get it in crisp sharpness and you can also see all of my micro blemishes and squid eels in HD, which I am super happy to bring you guys. And of course, big huge shout out to you guys out there, of course. Thank you so much to all of the Squiddies who have taken the time out of their day to support the channel, to check out a Squiddio or two. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you guys so much. Honestly, uh, just being able to make some Squiddies, uh, Squiddios on my free time throughout the day is a lot of fun. And I really, really love that people are choosing to watch them. And also all of you guys that have come up to say hi at events and stuff. I really, really love that. So thank you guys so much for uh, the support. And with that, let's just keep making Squiddios. Um, yeah, let's dive into today's Squiddio. I just wanted to make this quick little happy announcement because yay, it's awesome. All right, let's dive into today's Squiddio and talk about how to beat Floundries. I know a lot of people have had experience with this deck. Obviously, it's been roaming around for a long time, but it seems like people have sort of forgot how to beat it, especially because the deck is adapted over multiple iterations. We obviously got Barrier Statue banned, and now they're playing a lot differently than they normally do, and they're still really good in the matchup against decks like Unchained, and it seems like they just came out of nowhere to tear up the metagame. So let's talk about the deck. Well, first and foremost, the deck, for those of you guys that are unfamiliar, is basically a tribute summoning deck. They make use of their normal summoning and they're able to get multiple normal summons to end off with a board, generally with Flunderies and Empen, which prevents monsters from activating their effects while in attack mode if they are special summoned. And they also have the map on the field, which triggers when you normal summon. They can normal summon a monster from their hand and continue to full combo. And they can also play cards like the Flunderies and the Dreaming Town, which is also part of their setup, so they can tribute again and also put a Book of Moon effect, or rather Book of Eclipse, when they do tribute by banishing it from the graveyard. So this deck is very, very annoying, and in addition to just the core engine being rather hard to deal with, they actually have a lot of other supplementary non-engine cards, which is basically, in my opinion, what pushes the deck over the edge. Cards like D-Shifter, which have no drawback in this deck, and also broken cards like Harpy's Featherstorm, which is effectively a turn skip against any deck. Like, guys, losing game one is so freaking scary against a Floundaries because in game three, they're guaranteed going to be able to side in these powerful go first cards. They're going to be able to have Featherstorm as well as Shifter, so you will be crying if you lose game one, which is why I tell people, guys, you have to win against game one, so make sure that your deck is tailored in a way to beat this deck, and make sure you're using your hand traps to the maximum uh, percentage of winning and against the right cards. In addition to Empen being their primary tribute summon monster, they actually have a couple of other toolbox options that they make use of, including Mega Ryza, which is a monster that allows them to shuffle back up to three cards between the field and the graveyard. Especially annoying because they can actually top deck their own stuff in the graveyard. If they've shifted you, they can actually top deck the shifter, meaning that they're gonna be able to reshift you consecutively, unless you can stop that Mega Rising from resolving because shifter will be back on the top of the deck. The graveyard will be empty. They also play the Mist Valley Apex Avian, which is essentially an Omni Negate by bouncing itself. So just key things to note there. So without further ado, let's dive in and talk about what cards are needed to beat this deck. At the top of the list, we have Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Obviously, every deck should essentially be main decking this in some shape or form, especially at the beginning of a format. Against this deck specifically, I typically like to hold it actually for the birds that add. So you have the choice between Robina and Eaglin, obviously. In game one, I feel like it's a lot better to actually hit the Eaglin because this guarantees that they're actually not going to be able to get access to a level seven bird unless they actually hard drew it or they have another way to add it to the hand, including the uh, quick play spell card, Advent of Adventure, or something along those lines. But if you actually use the Ash on the Rabina and they actually have follow up and a way to get the Eaglin on the table, i.e. opening a map plus another bird, then they're still going to be able to tribute summon for the level seven monster. Whereas the Ash on the the Eaglin, I feel like it just cuts them off the higher chance of actually having a way to get access to the level seven. So even if they do have map, they might not have a immediate way to get access to an M pin, which means that you can actually pass their turn. 
Now, in game two and three, when you're going second, I would definitely recommend probably just using it on the Robina because that guarantees that there's less chance to get hit by the Harpy's Featherstorm, right? Like, even if we stop the Eaglin off Ash, they're still gonna have a Wind Wing Beast on the table, which means that they have a live Harpy's Featherstorm, which can easily be set off of something like Triple Tactics Thrust, which they do play multiple copies of in the latest iteration of the deck. So that's just my thoughts about Ash Blossom. I would also not hesitate to hit the Ash Blossom on the Pot of Prosperity for six, because the thing with Blue is they actually do brick quite a bit. This is still a sort of combo control deck. They do have to have access to Rubina or Eaglin plus another bird in order to play. So a lot of times cutting them off the Pot of Prosperity also means that you're going to be safe potentially from their engine. And otherwise you're also cutting them off from getting access to something like a Featherstorm, right? Because a lot of times, if they're starting off with Bottle Prosperity, that means they're probably digging for engine because if they had engine already, they might just start summoning the birds to thin the deck and then try and dig for Harpy's Feather Storm, right? Whereas vice versa, uh, if they're using it later, that means that they're probably digging for the Harpy's Feather Storm specifically. So that's why I wouldn't hesitate to Ash a Pot of Prosperity as a first action against this deck. Next is Droll Knockbird. I know, you guys, this card gives me PTSD. I said it's bad, but against this deck, it's very, very powerful because why? Everything adds. Like, Robina adds. You could go, they go uh, Robina Chain Link 1 and then resolve it, add the Eaglin, Normal Summon Eaglin, Eaglin Effect 1, and then we can chain the Droll Knockbird, and that means that they're not going to be able to add nor Normal Summon off of the Eaglin, which is crazy good. Also, in addition to that, they obviously play the Pots. They play Pot of Prosperity, Pot of Duality. Some of them even play the other Pots as well, like Extravagance. So, just like... Drolling off of any of these pots means they're probably skipping their turn because there's no easy way for the deck to function, right? Like this deck relies on adding, especially to get into their bigger birds like Enpen. Nibiru is obviously hideous against this deck. This should be sided out instantly. However, it's not always dead against this deck. Surprise, surprise. This deck, sometimes they do get greedy and actually normal summon up to five times. If they are going the standard Robina into the Eaglin, into the Empen, that's three summons. But if they continue to summon and choose to go for something greedy, like setting up an Apex Avian alongside Toucan and the Ostrich, that means that they are going to be going for the five summons, right? So you can actually nib on the fifth summon on the fifth bird so the toucan or the ostrich whichever is trying to resolve a normal summon again so then that way we nib them before they get the apex avian on the board it's not always going to be live obviously but there are niche scenarios in the grind game as well where it's live when they try to go for the mega monarch plays to break your board so that's just one thing to note when you do have the nib in game one Infinite Impermanence, Ghost Mourner, and Effect Failure. These cards are obviously very good, except for Ghost Mourner, because Ghost Mourner functionally does nothing against this deck because it only works against special summon monsters. So guys, I personally feel that Effect Failure is a lot better in this format, especially now that Flunder's won a YCS. So everyone's gonna be like, oh, maybe I can play this deck again. I wimp it out of the cupboard and play it. So Effect Failure is obviously very good against this deck. In my opinion, I treat these cards a lot like I would with the Ash Blossom, where uh, game one, I typically like to hold it for the actual Eaglin because this means that there's less of a chance. If this does resolve, they have to actually hard open the bird in order to continue playing. But it does depend a little bit because it can get dicey sometimes when they do have access to the Flunderies and the Advent Adventure. But there's no real way to play around this card, in my opinion. If they have it, they have it. It's kind of like if they have the Shavara when you do try to use a Valor on a Tour Guide against the Unchained matchup. I personally still believe that we should hold it for the Eaglin. If they do use the map, however, to summon out the Rubina and go into Eaglin, then maybe we would consider Valoring just the Rubina, because if that means that they opened the Rubina, the map, and the Big Bird, and we do use the Valor on the Eaglin, they can still use their regular normal summon to tribute off the two monster bodies, whereas if we Valor the Rubina, they just tribute one. So it depends on their starting line of play, but if they are going normal summon Rubina into the Eaglin, then I'll just hold it for the Eaglin. Now, that changes game two and game three a lot like Ash. We do want to play around Harpy's Weatherstorm, so actually using it on the first Rubina summon is crucial here because Robina happens to be a water wing beast, meaning that the Harpy's Featherstorm is actually not live when they do have the Soul Robina on the board. So if they did open Mediocre and only have the Robina and they try to push it through and we do use the Imperm or the Valor on the Robina, that means that the Featherstorm is potentially always dead in that scenario. So I would definitely use it in game two, game three because Featherstorm is a death sentence. If this card resolves, guys, we're losing the, the, the duel. Like 99 times out of 10, we're losing that duel. Next, let's talk about some board breakers because they seem to be popular in this format. If you're playing a board breaker like Dark Hole or like Book of Moon, Book of Eclipse, personally, I don't really like these cards against this deck. Why? Because if this deck is setting up, it only deals with the Ampen, which is a problem, but these guys are still going to have the 
Dreaming Town. So that means that you're going to have to deal regardless. You're going to have to deal with the second M pin unless you can actually stop whatever monster they're summoning off of the Dreaming Town or potentially the map, right? So if they have the full setup and we're getting rid of one M pin, it doesn't really do enough because we do have to answer the consecutive M pin or whatever else they're summoning. So that's why I don't really love these cards. But if you guys have nothing else to side in, then they can still be somewhat decent because they can also interact with cards like the Mist Valley Apex Avian, where it has to actually return the target to the hand. So actually chaining a Book of Moon or potentially Book of Eclipse on the targeted Mist Valley Apex Avian is going to mean that it stays on the field so we're not going to be negating anything with the effect so that's just one thing to keep note of obviously triple tactics thrust and talent are very very popular in this format and i actually don't think these cards are horrible against this deck unfortunately it does mean that you have to play into their actual back row so we do have to actually play into the map or play into the dreaming town but you can make that easily possible by also trying to enter battle phase because slow enemies in the dreaming town is only during main phase so if you are in a position where you think that you can bluff your opponent and say enter battle phase sometimes they will actually flip the dreaming town to try and summon out the mix apex avian so they're not going to be hit by the evenly matched right but it depends really on what their setup is if they have something like a feather storm already set then they probably don't really care about evenly matched so they might even let you go into the battle phase but it really really depends on what the player has and if they're good enough to suspect that you might be bluffing them but if you try to enter battle phase you could actually make the trust or the talents live so if you have nothing else to bait out a monster effect this is something you can definitely try now these cards are not obviously the best but thrust is nice because you can actually search for power cards like harpy's feather duster or like any cards that could put you ahead so i cu i currently like thrust quite well against this deck going second but tactics talent you're typically either going to steal an m pin or you're trying to draw two cards so it's not like the best card in the world but it's still something that gains marginal value so that's definitely something you guys can test out now it brings me to the spell and trap removal board breakers so cosmic cyclone and twin twisters these cards are obviously quite decent against this deck However, they do not serve as any counterplay to the actual problem non-engine cards that the deck plays, like Shifter and, of course, the Harpy's Featherstorm, especially when we're going second, right? It doesn't really deal with much, but the nice thing is it actually helps you survive in the event that they do Harpy's Featherstorm. We might be able to set these cards and hopefully turtle and survive one turn. Now, the really good part about Cosmic Cyclone and Twin Twisters when they don't have Harpy's Featherstorm is it actually snipes the Flanderies in Dreaming Town during the draw or standby phase. And because this card can only be activated in the main phase, they cannot respond and chain it. So you are getting rid of one of the most problematic cards that's a part of their setup. So I would definitely recommend siding in Cosmic Cyclones and maybe Twins if you already play them, and then sniping the Flanderies in Dreaming Town in the back row during the draw or standby phase. Sometimes you actually have to guess on a 50-50, but it is a good guess because you still, if you hit it, you might be put ahead, right? So that's just something to consider. Let's talk about some of the gold first cards, okay? Guys, some of the crazy gold first cards. Zombie World. This was a powerful side deck card when Flunderies were at tier 1 because it changes everything to zombies and neither player can tribute summon monsters except zombie monsters. So they cannot tribute summon winged beast monsters. It's very, very hard for them to actually get rid of the zombie world. So... If you guys are playing a zombie deck that can actually make use of zombie world or at least splash potentially necro world banshee which can be sent off something like a branded fusion or any other way to dump it in the graveyard and establish zombie world this card is pretty much game against one Reese. it's definitely not something the birds want to see they want to fly as birds and not zombies deck lockdown is also another go first option that's decently good it says neither player can add cards from their main deck except by drawing them so it means all of these effects are going to be shut off they're not going to be able to use their pot cards as well to dig for things to get removal for the deck lockdown. So I actually think deck lockdown is a decently good card. It's also viable against other decks like Unchained. There's a lot of crossover, guys. A lot of decks special summon or add from the deck to the hand, right? And nowadays, duels never really last past two turns or three turns. So having this card's restriction doesn't really count at all in the modern Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame. It's just like a straight one-sided floodgate. DNA Surgery is also another thing you could consider. It's a lot like Zombie World where you can just declare one monster type. The nice thing about this is we can actually declare a monster type of the deck that we're playing. So if we're playing like dragons, we could just call dragons and it doesn't really hurt us, but it hurts them. So it's more one-sided. This was popular during Dragon Ruler format when people would call dragons against spell books because it turned all the spellcasters into dragons. So this is definitely something to consider. But I feel like Zombie World and DNA Surgery are very one-sided options. There's not a lot of crossover. So unless Fundraise actually becomes a super problematic tier one deck then there's no real reason to side explicitly for one deck in my opinion and then if you guys are actually playing anti-spell fragrance which is such a problematic card that's still not banned 
Well, this card is decently good against this deck because they do play a lot of spells, obviously map, obviously the pot cards, and it's decently, decently good, especially with a board. Also, there's Magic Deflector, which is maybe even a little better because it actually does deal with the quick play as well as the field spell. So you're turning off things like the Unexplored Winds, you're turning off the Magnificent Map, and we're also potentially turning off the Advent Adventure if it's not chained directly to the Magic Deflector, right? So it's just really, really nice options to have there as well going first. For some other going second cards, I would say Evenly Matched is okay against this deck. Again, it does run into the issue where if you try and go into the battle phase, they can actually flip up the Dreaming Town to summon out an Apex Avian, so that just negates Evenly Matched. But if you pair Evenly Matched with other cards, it could actually do some real damage, especially getting rid of the Flunderese board. The annoying thing is all the birds go back to their hand when they're banished and you tribute summon, so it means they have a lot of recursion. So getting rid of their board doesn't really do much. We have to have follow-up on the consecutive play to ensure that they don't mount a comeback on their board. So that's why I'm not really a fan of that card, uh, and skipping the battle phase is not great in my opinion. Anyways, that's all I had for the video about how to beat Flu. If you guys have any other thoughts, tips, or anything that we missed on how to beat Flu, definitely let us know in the comments below because I would be curious. I really hate this deck and it's really, really problematic and annoying. I know it's not broken, but it's more than non-engine cards like Carpet Feather Storm and Shifter that really have to go. Other than that, we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for tuning in and yeah, we'll see you guys.